Morning, everybody. Yeah, I can see how thrilled you look also. On that, where did the Renaissance begin? Italy. What does Renaissance mean? Rebirth. And it was a rebirth of what? Yeah. Where were the ideas from? Classical ideas. Classical culture makes a return in the Renaissance. And so in Italy, we begin trying to imitate the Romans, and then we start trying to imitate the Greeks. And then we start trying to create new works that follow the models that were laid down during the Classical Age. This philosophical movement we call It led to a whole bunch of rules. Neoclassicism, neoclassics. Literal translation, the new classics, the new classics. And so once we've started producing these new classics, we start defining all these rules that they have to fit to be considered a new classic. Rules such as five acts. Horace said things had to be five acts because Seneca made things five acts, so now everybody has to produce five acts when they write a drama. What else? The three unities have to be obeyed. They went nuts over the three unities. Now the unities came from Aristotle, and remember Aristotle wasn't creating rules, he was simply observing and saying this is what works and this is what didn't. But when the Renaissance rolls around, they pick up his work and they're like, well, this is how it has to be done. These are going to become rules. And so we had the three unities, time, place, and action. And the unity of time dictated 24 hours, a single rotation of the sun. And so that plot has to be resolved in that time frame. Unity of place. You couldn't journey very far. So yeah, most plays did not change settings. You know, play opened up in a kitchen, play ended in the kitchen. If there were two settings, it would be like the closet, you know, or the pantry. You weren't going to move very far. And finally, the unity of action, which gave people headaches all the time. What? Well, no subplots were part of it. Had to stick to one story. Everything presented on stage had to be believable. You could not have the fantastic. You could not have a ghost story with a ghost on stage. You could not have two armies march across the stage because you're not going to have an army to march across the stage. The word they used was verisimilitude. You don't have to know that one, but basically it meant lifelike or you know, to be like life. And so the unity of action prevented you from presenting anything on stage that you couldn't reasonably pull off on stage. And this is going to become you know, rule for thought. You also had poetic justice. You know, the wicked are punished and the good are rewarded. You know, genres could not mix. Either you were writing tragedy or you were writing comedy. You were not able to, you know, put a joke anywhere in that tragedy. And this became the standard during the Renaissance for drama. 
That said, remember in Italy, the most popular theatrical form was able to avoid this stuff. That was It was built on stock characters. Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte did not have to follow all these neoclassical rules that were being thrown around that the drama had to follow because the commedia wasn't considered drama. And the reason behind that was it was improvised. Anything written down was considered an intellectual move and the neoclassics were an intellectual movement. And so when people wrote novels, they had to follow certain rules. When they wrote plays, they had to follow certain rules. Poetry had to follow, follow certain rules. But the Commedia, because you know, it was, okay, we're going to go out there and we're going to try this, this, and this, you know, it wasn't defined nor restricted by those rules. And so the Commedia had more of a free-moving form to it. I said that the Commedia was made of stock characters. There were three archetypes to it. Uh, we had our servants, our masters, and our lovers. And then they broke down into subclasses, basically. And you know, you had Pantalone, Bergella, uh, Truffaldino. But the most popular, and I dwelled on this one, was Arlecchino. Arlecchino was the most popular. It's where we get the English word Harlequin. And so we still use that name today when talking about the Commedia dell'arte. Um, the Commedia dell'arte is going to spread throughout Europe, and so is neoclassicism. As it moves north, it gets into France. And once it gets into France, the French go a step further, and the French don't only look down upon you if you're not following the rules. They actually create a government body to enforce those rules and shut down things that don't follow them. What was that government body? The French Academy, Academy Francaise. The French Academy comes into existence because of Pierre Cornel. Pierre Cornel, uh, Pierre Cornel wrote a play that the, you know, the French government looked at and said, you know, you're not following the unities, you're really jumping around everywhere, this can't happen in 24 hours, this is an unbelievable story that you're putting on. And so, you know, it has to shut down. And that show was Le Cid. And so the French Academy is basically started basically to stop one play. Now the French, you know, as they you know, basically condemn uh, Corneli, who, by the way, had a hit on his hands, people were running to it in droves, they turned around and praised Jean Racine. Jean Racine's play was Phaedra. Phaedra is considered the great neoclassic tragedy. And so Phaedra, the great neoclassic tragedy, gets Jean Racine a higher place in the French heart at the time. But both Racine and Cornell trail behind the big French playwright, and that was Moliere. Moliere, as I said before, is like saying Shakespeare in English. Moliere is that major figure, uh, the big contributor to theater. Uh, for the French. And so Moliere, though, is different than all the other guys before, different than, you know, even Shakespeare, in that he only wrote one type of play, and that was comedies. He wrote comedies. What was his primary profession? He was an actor. He toured for years in the provinces, acting. He wrote plays because the company he performed with needed plays to perform. That's what had him creating plays all the time. And so when they finally settle down in Paris, they've already got this big catalog of stuff that they can do. 
They are very popular, but also very controversial because of some of the plays he writes. The most controversial and considered his masterpiece is Tartuffe, which in French is a way of calling someone hmm? a hypocrite. In French, to say someone's a Tartuffe is to say they are a hypocrite. And so Tartuffe, a false religious man, fools a family, and in the end he was victorious, and so the church and the state shut down the play, and two years of rewrites finally led to an ending that we classify as a... considered one of the biggest in literature and theater. The Greeks actually used a device, the deus ex machina, a false or contrived ending. Because in the end, when Tartuffe has pulled everything off, all of a sudden, a guy walks in and says at the very end of the play, no, we've got to fix these things, and basically says the king is like a god because, you know, all kings rule by divine right. It was believed that God placed them there to rule others. And so, in the end, Louis XIV loved the play, even over some of the objections of the church, and the play went on. Um, Moliere literally performed until the day he died. Uh, he kept it going. Uh, in the end, as I mentioned before, when he died, they would not bury him on consecrated soil because they were still angry with him for a lot of the stuff he created. And that takes us now out of the neoclassical world, but still in the Renaissance. There were two nations that played outside of the rest of Europe. And while Europe was all the rage with neoclassicism and the Commedia was spreading and becoming very popular, these two nations were conquering. And I would claim that what they did in the Renaissance is still with us today. And they are the most successful empires to emerge from that period. One of them you should guess very easily, and that is Well, it wasn't that at the time. One of them is actually behind me. Spain and... Well, they weren't united at the time. It was England. England was still on its own. Great Britain or the United Kingdom is actually made of four states. But the thing is, England and Spain and if you look around the world at the most popular languages spoken, you look at South America, you look at the Caribbean, you go even into the Pacific Islands, you know, you know Spanish is prevalent, and that is a mark of this period. And then Australia, New Zealand, you know, Hong Kong, India, you know, North America, English dominates in so many places. And so these two languages started to spread in the Renaissance. While the rest of Europe was focusing on, you know, these internal issues, those two countries were building empires. And so one could argue that maybe they weren't as invested in all these cultural movements, but a bigger reason is these two countries were isolated. England was isolated because, geographically it is, it's an island. And so it's able to protect its borders very well. It's able to keep outsiders you know, away. And as a result, the Renaissance doesn't start there till about 100 years later. Now this is also because they have civil wars in England and they're also constantly trying to invade France, not to adopt French culture. And so they're gonna start late. Spain, on the other hand, is a peninsula. We get three sides of water, but this part that borders with France, that's a mountain range that is just treacherous. And so they're fairly isolated also. And so this amount of isolation helps out a great deal in their development. And they create a theater on their own that is very much alike with each other, but much different than the rest of Europe. And so Spain really gets underway under these two. This is Ferdinand and Isabella, and they are going to be easily the most important rulers during the Renaissance. And they are going to unify Spain. Now Spain 
you know, is just like, you know, any other, like when I showed you the Greek islands and they were all little city-states, and at the time when you look at Germany, there was no Germany. There were about 60 different little kingdoms that spoke German that had to combine together to finally make Germany. Well, Spain had a lot of the same issues until these two took over and really started to solidify. Another thing is that southern Spain was controlled by Moors. What are Moors? M-O-O-R. Moors are North African Muslims. Moors are North African Muslims. In Shakespeare's play, The Tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice. They're blacks. And so they have this Muslim issue in the south. They have divided areas. And they also have a large infidel population within Spain. That is until and this is a date you all know. This is Spain's breakout year. Now, Columbus was Italian, but his adventures were funded by Spain. You know, the reason Spain got to South America and the West Indies and everything else was, you know, Columbus sailing over, discovering, and then Spain sending over fleets and fleets of ships. And so, some of the things they did, they discovered the New World. Well, really didn't discover it, but they're the ones who really started commercializing it and starting shipping with it. Uh, they are going to defeat the Muslims in 1492 and drive them out. Basically, you know, you know, get rid of the infidel of the South, according to them. They're also going to have an edict to ban all non-Holy Mother Church faiths. And when we say Holy Mother Church, we're talking about Catholic. Catholic. Spain becomes a pure Catholic state. And so they pass an edict, basically by royal decree, that Jews have to leave the country. If they don't leave the country, they have to convert to Christianity, i.e. the Holy Mother Church. But even if they do convert, if the crown feels they haven't converted in their heart, they can be arrested and all their property seized, and they can actually be tortured. And so, you know, it's kind of like a gamble. Okay, we want to stay. Now, if they do leave, they're not allowed to take anything with them. And so, one way or the other, the state's going to end up with their stuff more than likely. And so they are going to get rid of the Muslims to the south. They're going to tell all the Jews to get out of the country. They're also going to remove what few Protestants are going to exist in that country. And so this was the big move by Ferdinand and Isabella, along with the New World being opened up. And all of it happens in 1492. Spanish Inquisition. This is the fate that led to anybody who they thought wasn't part of the Holy Mother Church. And it became infamous and famous. And so there are two major figures I want you to know from this period. Lope de Vega and Pedro Calderon. These are the only two I'm going to ask you about as far as the Spanish Golden Age. There were more individuals involved at that time, but these easily were the two biggest. Pedro Calderon, uh, many people consider to have written the great Spanish drama. But as far as the great Spanish playwright, as far as output, is easily Lope de Vega. Lope de Vega may have produced more plays than any other playwright, period. And so with Lope de Vega, you know, like here, 80 of his plays are considered masterpieces. Some scholars put his plays at around 800. To put that into perspective, Shakespeare has about 36. And we know that because there's some plays that are lost. You know, and so we have 36 of his plays now. With De Vega, we have over 400 of his plays, which is remarkable. I think we have like 470. And so that is a huge number of plays. Now, one of the reasons we have you know, so many plays by this individual is that he was more like a television writer. 
If I ask you guys who writes your favorite television shows, most people will be completely blank. And most of those shows, 45 minutes when you put in all the commercials. Well, the Vegas shows were generally about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Hamlet uncut, you're looking at five hours. And so Shakespeare shows, you know, you were settling down for an entire evening, you know, if not a full day of work. Where with De Vega, you know, his stuff was, okay, they go in, they see it, and they're out of there. You know, there's enough time to go do things afterwards. One of the big things De Vega did that we can keep turning to to see how he created so many plays is he wrote the new art of playwriting or the art of writing plays, depending on how you want to translate it. And in the new art of playwriting, he is going to make a statement that is completely contradictory to the neoclassical world that's developed around you know, the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe says you've got to do this to create a play, and you have to do this to create a play, and you've got to do this. And De Vega comes in there and basically says, eh, plays are about three acts. You know, You don't need the big stuff. But the thing he says that's really controversial for the time is drama should give the audience what they want. In a neoclassical world, you wrote something and the audience came and they liked it or they left and they didn't like it. De Vega wrote his plays with the audience in mind the whole time. Pierre Canelli and, and Moliere also thought about their audiences a great deal, but you know, remember Racine, what he wrote you know, it may have been poetic, but it wasn't action-packed. A lot of De Vegas plays are action-packed. And also, in De Vegas plays, a lot of them are about common people. You know, when we look at Tartuffe, well, it's a noble family, very upscale. You know, we take a look at Phaedra, same thing. You know, this, this father is a general in the military, you know, he's very prestigious. You know, La Cid, well, the Cid was this great warrior from a noble family who's traveling down to battle the Moors in the south of Spain. All these plays are about big individuals. When we take a look at De Vegas, you know, they're about farmers. They're about merchants. You know, they're about the people who work around here. Now, in the end, royalty or nobility may have to be brought in to save them, you know, but those people are not the main characters of the show. They're not the ones who carry it. It's the common people who carry it, and then the others are used basically to bail them out, because in the end, royalty had to play a part. Here it says De Vega's most famous play, The Sheep's Well. Uh, the Sheep's Well is about a lord who is incredibly harsh on the village the king has placed him over. He keeps charging higher taxes. You know, people can't make it, and he starts confiscating their stuff. He's driving people to starvation. And then one day he turns up dead. And so the king sends a person down there to figure out what happened. And in his investigation, he gets a person who confesses, you know, I did it. But then another person says, no, I did it. And before you know it, every male in town over the age of about 14 has confessed to killing this guy. And so you have all these common people who have basically confessed to a capital crime, and now he's got to decide what to do, because he knows not everybody could have done this. And so he makes a decision for the king and says, well, if this many people have said that this guy had to go, then he probably had to go. And then it ends in a big celebration. This doesn't happen in a neoclassical world. Villagers can't kill the person in charge and expect things to be okay. You know, bad things are going to happen to them. And so this is completely contradictory to what was going on in the rest of Europe. And then we have Pedro Calderon. Now, Calderon's life is a dream. And Crash Course, I think, does a fairly good job, if you want to look up this one, uh, of explaining this play. But this play really has a lot of similarities with Oedipus Rex. Uh, mine is sleeping with mom or gouging your eyes out. And so a son is born, and his father is told by a fortune teller that his son will overthrow him. And so he doesn't send him to a far off land, he puts him in a prison. And so the kid grows up in a prison, you know, he gets out, you know, he raises an army, and of course in the end he does overthrow his father. But then 
he forgives his father. You know, he doesn't, you know, destroy him or anything else. And what he tells him at the end is, no man can change the stars, which is a great line about how fate plays a big part in what we do. You couldn't alter it. Everything you do leads to that point. Now, one thing I want you to know about Calderon is that he was a court poet. He was a court poet. Can anybody tell me what a court poet is? Well, the court is the royal court. It means he was employed by the crown to write for the royals. And so they could actually go to him and say, listen, we're bored. We want you to write a play for us to see in the next couple of days. And he would go to work on one. You know, he, they could say, you know, we'd like to hear some poetry. And he'd go to work on some poetry. You know, he was a employee. And so if he didn't feel like writing one day, you know, it was okay. He was still going to get paid. Lope de Vega, on the other hand, de Vega was an actor. And like Moliere, he had to write. In fact, de Vega, though, was like a man of many hats. He constantly was changing things. You know, he was a soldier, an adventurer. You know, an actor, you know, you name it, he probably did it. Both men, by the way, at the end of their lives became priests. It was a Spanish thing. And so, this is a Spanish theater. Everybody in here should already know what it's called. Why? Because it was one of the questions on the quiz. And everybody goes, that was hours ago. I was asleep before I got here. So it was at least eight hours ago. Spanish theaters were called a corral. They were an outdoor theater. There was seating on the ground, just as you see the seating on the side. But, you know, it's not a proscenium which takes over the neoclassical world. They don't have a lot of stage illusions or perspective drawings. Everything was just done by actors going out there with a few hand props. You know, square building, acting space, you know, it's just a platform basically. You know, this is like the definition of the flexible stage in many ways. Um, you know, seating went all the way back. You had some of the upper class individuals that could have the balconies and some nobles who were off to the sides. You know, and some people in the front row were of higher rank. But, you know, after that, you know, it was a public space. You know, and they were very popular. Men and women went to go see shows, you know, in other parts of the world, including England at this time when women went. You know, it was considered a little scandalous at times. You know, but for the Spanish, the theater was just that thing. From 1492 to 1588, Spain is quite possibly the most powerful nation in Europe. They have went to the New World and pulled in tons of gold. Uh, their exploits have, you know, solidified colonies in South America, everywhere but Brazil the Portuguese got. Uh, they run all the way up to Mexico. They've got quite a few islands, Cuba, you know, um, uh, you know, Honduras, you know, you name it, you know, they are basically planting flags in it right now. But in 1588, their fortunes are going to change dramatically. Anybody out of Western Civ can tell me what happened on this date? Well, it gets a bit complicated, but what it comes down to is England has had a lot of turmoil and Spain decides to try and take advantage of it and attempts to invade England. And in 1588, the Spanish Armada, the greatest navy uh, that the world knew at the time, sets sail for England. And they are decimated. It is a horrible defeat by the Spanish, uh, to the Spanish. 
And so, in fact, you know, it's strong, strongly believed Lope de Vega was actually on one of the ships that was heading there because, you know, he was that guy who constantly changed hats. And this was a great opportunity. And so the Spanish are defeated. And at this moment in 1588, England, almost by default, becomes the most powerful nation on the seas. And if you controlled the seas, you controlled commerce. It was a very big deal. But the Royal Navy at this point you know, earns its title, which is going to remain all the way up until the Second World War. And so it just becomes that big dog. And so what was that turmoil over in England that was causing all this? Well, it starts with this guy. This is Henry VIII. Somebody please know, what is Henry VIII famous for? What? Well, he had six wives, but you were close. Henry VIII had six wives. And this was a big no-no at the time. And the reason is England at the time was also a Catholic nation. And under Catholicism, divorce was not possible. Once you were married, you were married. Things go south, you deal with it. Things go further south, you start hoping the other one dies. It just gets worse and worse from there. And so you cannot divorce. But he runs into a major issue, and the issue is quite simple. When he was young, he was married for diplomatic reasons, of all things, to a Spanish woman, Catherine of Aragon. And with her, he's only going to have one child, and that child's a daughter. And so, as Catherine has gotten older, and he knows she can't bear children, he starts to worry, well, what's going to happen when I die? Now, when he takes over, they had just gotten out of several civil wars, and it was a bad scene, and he's trying to prevent more civil wars. And so he petitions the church and says, well, I want to leave her, and I want to marry someone else. And of course, the church says no. So he modifies a bunch of things, tries you know, negotiating with the church, and the church comes back again and says no. And he continually tries to work within the church, and they keep telling him, no, you can't divorce your wife. So all of a sudden, he declares, and it wasn't that quick, but you know, he declares that England is no longer a Catholic nation. This was a very big deal at the time. And in fact, he is going to found his own religion. And in his religion, you can get divorced. And that religion is still with us today. It is called the Church of England. The Church of England. And of course, under the Church of England, the head of the church would be the king. And so, you know, he's writing the rules for what the Church of England. The Church of England also, it's all over the world. In this country, we call it Episcopal. But it was started under the Church of England. And so, as he founds a new religion, he is going to marry a woman named Anne Boleyn. She is a Protestant. You know, she was agging him on, telling him the whole time, well, we don't need the church. We can break from the church. We don't need this. We can do this on our own. So he marries her, and she has one child, but it's also a girl. And then she goes through several miscarriages, and he realizes she's not going to be able to have the son he needs. And so he decides, you know, oh, my God, I made this great mistake. You know, I didn't produce a male heir. You know, I'm going to look really bad over this. I've got to figure a way out. And so he accuses her of witchcraft and a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, well, she did this to make me leave my wife and everything else and has her head cut off. And that way he doesn't have to divorce her, and now he can go marry another woman. Woman number three finally has the son he's been waiting for. She dies in childbirth. And he's going to get married three more times before this is all over with, but he doesn't have any more children. So we have three children, a daughter by Catherine of Aragon, a daughter by Elizabeth, and then that son. That son is Edward. Henry dies. Edward takes over. He's a teenager. He's a Protestant, and he's a fire and brimstone Protestant. And so there's still a Catholic presence on the island, and he tries to wipe it out by burning them you know, everywhere he can find them. Well, he dies a teenager. He was a sickly kid his entire life. 
And so now it has to pass to the oldest daughter, which is Queen Anne, who comes from Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon being Spanish, what faith was she? She was Catholic. And so Anne becomes queen, and she declares, okay, we're not Protestant, we're going to be Catholic again. But now England's loaded with Protestants that she has to deal with. So she starts burning Protestants everywhere she can find them to try and unify the country. Well, she dies, and now the crown is going to pass one more time, and that's to Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth. And she is going to take over for 60 years. You know, I think right now it's the third longest reign, which is incredible for the time period that she was living. And so Elizabeth is going to be the queen when English drama explodes. She's also going to be the queen when the Spanish Armada attempts to take over and gets kicked out, and England becomes a superpower in the world finally and gets rid of all this war and strife. She also, when she takes over, tells everybody, okay, we're Protestant again. And one of the things she does when she becomes Protestant is she bans religious plays. And the reason is England was still doing mystery plays when she took over. They were still do, you know, debating on what you know, gospel to use or this Gnostic gospel. They were still doing morality plays. And she steps in and basically says, you know, we have enough religious problems in this country. You know, we're getting rid of all this stuff. And this is going to usher in a whole bunch of secular drama. She also doesn't want political plays, even though they slip a lot of them in under a new genre of theater that's going to be explored. But that said, you know, she is the one who solidifies this and is going to be there for what is called England's Golden Age. And so this is our first major figure. We'll have three with the English Renaissance. And you can probably guess the last one we'll get to without a problem. But Christopher Marlowe, Kid Marlowe. Now, Marlowe was in a group that was known as the University Wits. He was university educated. And though he may not look like it in the portrait of him, uh, he was a pretty rough individual. He was a drinker, a bar brawler, a womanizer. You know, all the things that you would think of, of, of you know, the typical artist of the time. And he lived in excess. Uh, with all the education and everything else he had, he wrote easily some of the most important plays that came out of that period. He and Shakespeare were actually born the same year, and I would argue in their lifetime, Marlowe was producing greater works. And if it wasn't for some unfortunate incidents, you know, we could actually be talking about Marlowe as that great individual in English playwriting, and we'll get to that, but... Marlowe was the man who really defined the way English drama was going to become written. And his big thing that he popularized was known as Marlowe's Mighty Line. He's the guy who really popularized iambic pentameter. And so if you've ever taken an English class where they talk about Shakespeare, they talk about, oh, he wrote an iambic pentameter. Oh, he wrote an iambic pentameter. Oh, he wrote in this iambic pentameter. It's a fancy way of saying he wrote in poetic form. But, you know, Marlowe was the guy who really got that started. Uh, his most famous play is Dr. Faustus, which, by the way, is written the year of the Armada coming in. And Marlowe's mighty line refers to a line within that, is this the face that launched a thousand ships? Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? The way that's written, the way that the beat goes up and down, up and down. That's iambic pentameter. In Dr. Faustus, an individual makes a deal with the devil. And in that deal, he's going to get a certain amount of wishes. And with those wishes, you know, everything's going to be granted. But at a certain time, on a certain day, at midnight... He's going to lose his soul. And so he's like, hey, sounds like a bargain. And so he gets these wishes, and you know, he becomes the smartest man who has ever lived. He has infinite knowledge. And one of his wishes is he wants to make love to the most beautiful woman in history. Now, we've actually had allusions to this when we dealt with the Greeks. When the Agamemnon sails off for the Trojan War, it's because Helen of Troy has abandoned the Greeks and run off with the Trojans. 
And so Helen of Troy is considered the most beautiful woman because an entire war was fought over her. And the devil's like, well, fine. And bam, Helen of Troy appears and he sees her and says, is this the face that launched a thousand ships? The idea that all these ships set sail to try and get this one woman back. And so he's granted all these wishes. And now, near the end of his bargain, you know, the clock's getting closer and closer to midnight. And he realizes the folly of his ways. And his final monologue in this show, it's a soliloquy actually, he's talking out to the audience, is just gorgeous. It's one of the great you know, writings in theater from the English Renaissance. And he talks about how he has robbed himself of grace. You know, he will never experience that salvation. And he looks up at the hour and he's like, you know, time stands still. You know, planets hold your place. You know, he's begging for things to stop, and the play ends with the chime of midnight. You know, and it's a phenomenal play. He wrote some controversial plays. His Edward II actually got banned. It was considered too political, you know, when political plays, you know, were a no-no. He kept saying, oh, it's not very political. It's just about the, the life of the man. I'm not talking about his politics. And they were like, his life was his politics. You can't get around this stuff. But his big contribution, he didn't invent iambic pentameter. He didn't, you know, try, you know, he wasn't the first to try and put poetry into drama. He was the one who was so, uh, so successful, everyone else imitated him. And so Shakespeare started writing like this, and all the other guys, Webster, Johnson, you know, it was just, you know, a onslaught of people running in there and starting to put up stuff. And so Dr. Faustus, his iambic pentameter is blank verse. Get that down. Blank verse. Blank verse is simply a poetic term for it's poetry that does not rhyme. It follows a meter. There's a certain, you know, syllable stress. And there's a whole bunch of different poetic forms, but the one he chose of blank verse is that unrhymed meter. Verse is when it's in a poetic meter. Prose is when it's in conversation, just like you and I talking back and forth. And so he combined both. At times a character is speaking prose, at times he's speaking verse. Um, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, whenever Hamlet is talking to himself, he's often talking to himself in uh, prose. You know, when he's talking to other people, you know, he's talking in verse. And so, more information on that. You know, here's his mighty line. You know, and burnt the topless towers of Ilium, sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. And this was probably one of the most quoted lines of the Renaissance when it came out. Everybody was jumping on this play. Now, I said Marlowe, had it not been for an unfortunate incident, would probably be that big figure we have today. Uh, Marlowe was dead by the age of 29, which is, you know, very young, even for this time period, for a person who makes it through childhood. You know, if you could make it to your 20s, you were probably going to make it to your 40s. And if you made it to your 40s, you were probably going to make it to your 60s. The reason the life expectancy was so low at this time is so many people died in infancy. And so you had, you know, just thousands of miscarriages, you, had, you know, you know, most births were at home, and it was kind of like, good luck. Let's see what happens with this time. And then people were having nine, you know, ten children. You know, Henry, on the other hand, had to get a bunch of wives because it was actually his fault. He couldn't have children for the most part. He just blamed every woman. At 29, Marlowe had a horrible accident of being stabbed repeatedly in the head. And so with that, Marlowe's career came to a quick end. And the reason behind this is, is still argued over, you know, and one of the leading reasons that is given is Marlowe was also drawing a government check, but he wasn't a court poet. Marlowe was being paid to be a spy. Like I said, he was a pretty rough guy. He did a lot of things on the side. And it seems he also spent a significant amount of time in Holland spying on the Catholics who were attempting to overthrow Elizabeth. Now, did the Catholics find out that he was a spy and get rid of him? 
or did the crown think he had turned on them and was now working for the Catholics? That's one of those big debates. What isn't debatable is at 29, he goes away, and it's from this point forward that Shakespeare stands alone. You know, there's no more big competition or big influence. You know, after Marlowe passes away, you know, Shakespeare establishes himself as that big name. He was a big guy before, but after this, there's nobody else in a sentence with him. Uh, this is the other big figure I want you to know, Ben Johnson. Johnson was a court poet. Johnson was a court poet, and he does have a big influence on theater. His plays are much more wordy than both Shakespeare's and Marlowe's. He was the only person I can think of in the English Renaissance who wrote plays who thought of his writings as literature. Now, when playwrights created plays, generally actors only got their part. You didn't get the whole play. It was like, here's your scenes, learn your cues, and we'll pick up the rest in rehearsal. And one of the reasons behind this, you know, plagiarism, copyright didn't exist, and so people were constantly trying to steal from one another. You know, it was an awful, you know, you know constant threat. And so if you wrote an entire play and it disappeared, you were in trouble. If you wrote a play and everybody had pieces of it and a piece disappeared, well, you can go to rewrites. You know, they don't have the whole play. That's one of the reasons for it. But Johnson, he didn't care. Johnson actually paid for his own stuff to be published. You know, he wanted to be known as a writer. And so he was that big writer at the time. In fact, he rose to be a court poet. And so, you know, like Pedro Calderon, he could be called on, you know, I want to play by next week. I want to be able to get this stuff out of the way. Or they could turn around and say, hey, you know, write me a birthday card to send to the King of France. You know, whatever he was commanded to write, he would write. And though he did have a solid, you know, career in his own way, uh, you know, Valpone is probably one of his most famous plays. A Comedy of Humors is a, a very famous play. I think Crash Course does a very good idea, uh, job uh, giving you the story of Alpone. Perhaps he is most known because all these guys knew each other who were writing in the Renaissance. Um, in Spain, the Spanish playwrights knew each other. In England, the English playwrights knew each other. Uh, they would go out drinking with each other. They would argue with each other. Ben Johnson hung out with Shakespeare. Uh, they hung out at times with Marlowe. Nobody liked him. You know, he was just that individual. You know, he was constantly going to bars just to start a fight. He was that individual. You know, probably what Ben Johnson is actually known for more than anything is after Shakespeare died uh, and they finally printed his work, because Shakespeare, remember, you know, no playwright was publishing at the time. After he passed away, a bunch of actors got his work published, and Johnson was one of the people who wrote a tribute at the beginning of this copied work. And this is one of the most famous lines uh, in theater, which doesn't, you know, actually factor into a play. It's basically the elegy over to Shakespeare. And so theater in Spain and England, actually it was a lot alike. You know, they didn't have the proscenium. They weren't following neoclassical rules. You know, they, their plays lasted for hours, you know, except the Vegas, which were like, all right, let's get this over with. You know, they didn't have to have poetic justice. A lot of their plays end, you know, with very plot problematic endings. You know, they'll have a comedy, and it ends with everyone going to jail instead of dying. You know, it's not exactly the easiest thing to deal with. Um, but that wasn't the only similarity. Their drama developed a lot the same. You know, for the Spanish, it was a square theater with a platform. For the English, it was a round theater with a platform. They had a few theaters that were in this design. The most famous of which was the one that Shakespeare worked in. It was called the Globe, the Globe Theater. Their big rival was the Rose, where Marlowe wrote most of his plays for. But after Marlowe goes, the Globe becomes, you know, one of those big popular theaters. But, you know, the same type of staging. Now, one of the differences is, you know, 3,000 spectators, you know, three stories high. 
you know, everybody should know what was the cheapest ticket to get in. What? Well, that was it, but how much did it cost? A penny. You pay a penny to get in, and then you got the stand if you just paid a penny. And though the play lasted five hours for like Hamlet, you were usually there for seven. And so before the play even began, they would have somebody up on stage telling jokes and doing dances and singing songs. And after a play was over with, they would have more of this. You know, they were selling beer all the way through these shows. I mean, it was, you know, more rollicking than anything. And the audiences were not what we expect in theaters today. In fact, other countries, when their people saw English plays, they went back and wrote that English audiences were incredibly rude. They yelled at the actors. You know, they had a horrible time, you know, trying to sit there and watch compared to watching theater in Spain or Italy or other places. Because the English audiences, it was more like a sporting event. They were rooting for certain characters. They were booing certain characters when they came on stage. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, they had completed a replica of the globe uh, built to spec. Uh, it did have one great innovation that the original globe did not have. The original globe had no toilets. And so all they did was pass buckets in the back. And so, you know, we had a great, you know, you know, change when we finally rebuilt the thing. But they still do shows in it, still on the platforms, uh, still in the original style. Uh, during the Elizabethan age, please remember, no women were allowed on stage. Though the Commedia started allowing women to perform, though in Spain women were performing, England held that it was immoral for a woman to get on the stage. You know, they did not want to see women on stage, and this is one of the reasons when women did go to theaters, they generally tried to make themselves inconspicuous sitting in the back. You know, they were not out there to be seen. And, you know, if they needed a female part, it was usually a young prepubescent boy who played the, you know, the women's parts. And this is one of the reasons that you have so few women in English Renaissance shows. In fact, you know, when I look at like Henry V, there's two women. Richard III, there's four. You know, King Lear, there's three. You know, I can go play for play and you just don't have a lot of female parts. And then in a lot of the plays, you have a female part, but then she disguises herself as a man. Why? Because it was easier for them to act like they were going to be a man than playing these female parts at times. The moment the voice changed, either he was out of the company or he was promoted to be a regular actor. And so this I have up here for this right here, which you can't see very well, but it says bear baiting and then where the globe was located. English theaters were multi-use spaces. And when they weren't being used for theater, they were used for different events. The English were a lot like the Romans and that they enjoyed their blood sports. Uh, generally, the pit was turned into a dog fighting arena in the evening. Why? Because it's very easy to put some torches up and have the fights and gambling was a big deal. Bear baiting is when they tied a bear and a whole bunch of dogs with tags would go out there and attack it and the dog that killed the bear was the winner. And of course the bear took out quite a few dogs. But you know, cockfighting, dogfighting, bear baiting, these were normal things in Renaissance England. And the reason I show this is we often take the past and we glorify it. We paint over it, we try to make it look you know, really pretty. And that includes in films and, you know, various sundry media. England was dirty and it was mean. And most of the Renaissance, with all its high culture and everything else, if we looked at it today and were there, we'd be freaking out. You know, there was no germ theory. You know, people weren't washing all the time. You know, you, you swam to take a bath, you know, every few months maybe. You know, flowers were at funerals because the body smelled most of the time. And, you know, it was a very mean place overall to try and make it. 
And these were just normal events for people to go to and enjoy their time. And also, just like the Romans, you know, they had no problem having violence on stage. In their plays, they would have wars and battles and everything else. One of the first cash crops discovered in the New World, and England's uh, colony started off in Virginia, and the Carolinas was tobacco. And this was another thing when you went to go see a play in Renaissance England. You were looking through plumes and plumes of smoke. You know, when that cash crop made it back to Europe, it exploded. Columbus introduced it to the New World, uh, but it was not until a generation later it really found its core marketing. Some guys started shipping it over by the boatload, and tobacco became all the rage. And so smoking was extremely high in Renaissance England. Uh, this pamphlet was actually put out by King James, and it was his anti-smoking uh, anti pamphlet. He couldn't stand the fact that you couldn't go anywhere without walking into clouds of smoke. And so King James, though, we mainly know for the Bible. King James was a Protestant who is married to a Catholic. And when he takes over after Queen Elizabeth, uh, England is still divided religiously. Now, Elizabeth had peace, but she strong-armed a lot. And he came in and really wanted, hey, we should all just get along. But then there's an assassination attempt made on him, and he becomes just as hard as anyone else. And he orders a new translation of the Bible in English. Because they were under the Holy Mother Church, they had still been using the Bible under Latin. And he wants an English translation, and he wants anything seditious, anything that calls for re revolution, pulled out of there. And there's a lot of myths and rumors of how it got created. Some people say he sent it off to you know, 40 poets after it went through translators, and they really spruced it up and made it. And, you know, some people say, well, Shakespeare had a hand in it. We don't know any of that. What we do know is that the King James Bible becomes the dominant bo Protestant Bible, you know, basically of the English-speaking world. This is what you'll find in Australia. This is what you're going to find, you know, uh, in New Zealand, you know, British Columbia, over in Canada, throughout the United States. This becomes the standard. And so you've all seen it before. It is the dominant of the Protestant faith. And that takes us to our last major figure. The guy you probably got tortured with at least once, maybe twice in high school. And it's a shame because most high schools are going to choose the safest plays or the most famous plays that have the least controversy, uh, controversial topics attached to them. In fact, when Shakespeare was being introduced into education in North America, they generally went with like Julius Caesar, arguing that it had classical words in it, and we could start training people with some Latin also. And there's nothing like turning page for page in a uh, Roman political thriller to you know just really hook people to the idea. But Shakespeare is today regarded as our greatest writer in the English language. He is going to write sonnets, and he is going to write plays. And yet he's one of the most mysterious figures in our history. And for a long time, and there's still people today who will argue he never existed. You know, they'll say, well, Queen Elizabeth wrote his works, but she was a woman, so she couldn't take, you know, credit for it. And some people will turn around and say, well, it was actually Marlowe. And then when Marlowe died, people found a bunch of unpublished works by him and started publishing them. But I promise you, if Marlowe had written them, you know, Marlowe would be waving them in the air saying, I did this. That's who Marlowe was. And so there is a, a lot behind, you know, tons of individuals, Francis Bacon, you know, that people were like, oh, they had to write them. There was a Shakespeare. And one of the reasons that we have so little history on him, and this, when I was in college, this was still a topic that was up for debate, but he was Catholic. And you couldn't be Catholic openly in Protestant England. And so he made himself invisible. And so you find him in a few court cases. 
You find him with a couple of like deeds. You find him in court records for wills and stuff. But outside of that, he's not like Ben Johnson, who's you know getting his stuff published and becoming a court poet eventually. You know, he's not putting himself out there a lot. But he is an individual we know existed, and we know he was an actor first. He came to London to be an actor. He wrote plays for the company he was working in. He was no different than Lope de Vega. He was no different than Moliere. And though it's unpopular to say this in an English class, Shakespeare wrote for a living. He wrote for money. That doesn't mean, you know, it takes nothing away from him. I mean, this was his profession, you know. And when he wrote, at no time did he look at his stuff and say, this is going to be great in 400 years. He didn't publish anything. Nothing was published until after he was gone. He was writing for that time. And he was a shareholder in the theater he was a member of. And so the more people who came to see a play, the more money he made. And so he had to write things that people wanted to see. You know, I think on the first day we actually had a lecture I told you about the play Titus where they're cutting out tongues and cutting off hands and cutting up kids and baking them into pies and everything else. He wrote horror, you know, at times. He wrote comedies. He wrote tragedies. You know, he wrote plays about kings and plays about, you know, those who have very little, farmers, you know, agricultural workers. He wrote plays that take place in the Roman period. He wrote a bunch of plays that take place in Italy. You know, you name it, he was going to write it at the time and stuff it into 36 plays. And so the company he ended up working with was the Lord Chamberlain's Men. That was the company that was performing at the Globe. When James I takes the throne, King James, he is going to want a royal theater company. And so he looks around and decides this is the best company, and so they become the king's men. And so basically the king gets bored. He can basically say, hey, bring that troop in here. And actually they do a bunch of plays at the palace for the royals. You know, it becomes a very big deal. And as a result, they're all receiving government pay at this point to be actors, which further probably complicates his life being a Catholic, that now he's performing for a Protestant king. And so Lord Chamberlain's men, 1603 is when they're going to become the king's men. You know, and they do have two theaters eventually, the Globe, and they also have a theater called the Blackfriars, which was an indoor theater which was much different than everything else because now they could perform in the winter. You know, theater was a seasonal thing. It opened up in the spring as soon as they could. They would run through the summer, and then when the temperature finally turned, you know, they had to close down. And also, the theater closed often for plague. You know, if any disease started sweeping through the town, theater was closed. You know, there was no spacing out like we do now. It was, okay, everybody go home and stay away. And the reason is, many Protestants actually said that theater caused the plague. Why? Because people would go to the theater, then they'd leave the theater and they'd get sick. And so, you know, theater got a pretty bad rep at that time. You know, they didn't have germ theory, of course, and so they didn't realize it was just people jamming in next to each other. Shakespeare is going to be on the cusp of a new genre that's going to emerge. Now, the old classical genres were what? Tragedy and comedy. Shakespeare is going to have what we call histories today. And so he starts writing histories. Other people are doing it too. But, you know, history becomes a very big topic for him. The most he wrote were comedies. He has more comedies than tragedies and then histories. And then there are four romances that he also wrote. And so we have new genres that start to emerge at this time. We start calling the romances romances after he was gone. People were looking at him saying, this isn't really a comedy. Look how this works out. And he wrote some plays that people also call problem plays. You know, there were comedies that were not funny in the least. Merchant of Venice, Measure for Measure. You know, these weren't exactly comedies, you know, that made people fall out of their chairs laughing. And they end you know, very tough on some people. The King James Bible has probably 
11,000 unique words if you count them just once. So if you count the once and you count is once, you're going to end up with about 11,000 words. Um, with Shakespeare, we have, I think, in his work, 28,000 unique uses of words. Some words that didn't even exist, you know, down here, accommodation, assassination, obscene, you know, premeditated, swagger, you know, gloomy. The first time those appear, uh, phrases like the game is afoot. In fact, the most quoted line in the English language is a line from Shakespeare. That line being, and no, it's not Romeo or Romeo. It's from what many people consider to be his great play, to be or not to be. That is the question. That is the most quoted line in the English language. Now, I could spend hours breaking down every Shakespeare play for you, you know, going over them, talking about them. Uh, our next class, we're actually just going to watch a documentary that's going to really sum it up quickly, uh, so I'm not just dwelling on this play and this play and this play. And, um, you know, that's what we're going to work on next time, uh, but I am going to tell you where to take notes in it before it starts, because there are some things you're going to have to get out of it um, you know, it's kind of vital in that way. So that said, folks. <laughs>